Smart. The Smart Camp that we've been running today has been a series of four Smart Camps we've run across Africa. We started in Nigeria uh, and then in Kenya, I think it's the other way around, and then um, we held one in Cape Town recently in August and today we held one for the Johannesburg startups. Okay. It's part of the program. The program is aimed at helping startups that are building or using technology to accelerate into market or get them to market faster. It's about trying to provide the right resources at the right time. So um, today we had five startups that competed upstairs. They gave a pitch and then um, we invited our mentor partners from, from Johannesburg and from Cape Town and uh, basically broke up into five mentor sessions uh, where the the uh, mentors took what they were from, from the, the, all the information from the initial pitches and tried to provide uh, some guidance and some uh, information or guidance and uh, suggestions to help them improve, take them forward. So, um, without further ado, where we basically would like to announce the winner today for the Johannesburg IBM Smart Camp. And if I can grab the thing. It's heavy. All right. Um, it gives me great pleasure to announce that Afrocast uh, won today. They beat, uh, uh, let me just get right, Contactable, RoadBuddy, Ingenuity Solutions, and iPulse Transact. So very well done, guys. Big hand of applause for them. <laughs> Guys, uh, congratulations. Jump up here, jump up here. We've got to get some pictures for you. you know. <laughs> All right, so Thank congratulations, Vizzy. Thank you. Thank All you. the best. Sure. So what's going to happen next? We just need some photos. Why well, got me in the middle? Though. <laughs> you, need, you need the winners and the talented people here. All right. Well done, guys. So um, what's going to happen now? As I explained, we've got the, the, the regional finals, the Kenyans, and unfortunately, our Kenyan winner and our Nigerian winner couldn't get any visas, so they didn't, weren't able to travel to South Africa. But um, our judges have been watching and looking and deliberating around their videos, and um, we're going to put our Cape Town winner on the stage now, and you guys are up next, and we want to just show and uh, showcase the sort of uh, quality that we've had today, which has been awesome, and what we've been seeing around the country and uh, the other regions in Africa. So, um, Simon, Roy, we want to come up and give us a presentation. You guys go to the Thanks, guys. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Simon from Womdrop in Cape Town, and that's Roy, but he'll get to you in a second. Is our presentation rolling? Guy at the back, you're my man. Cool, next one, please. So guys, we're um, Wimdrop. Wimdrop is an on-demand, uh, it's an on-demand delivery service. Um, there are a few problems in the world. One, if you're a customer, it sucks having something sent to you, right? If you have a, something sent to you, a package, you're almost never at the same place at the same time as your courier guy. And next one, please, guy at the back. One does not simply enjoy buying stuff off the internet, for example. Next slide, please. Yo, another problem. If you're a business, sending items to customers or other branches is slow and prohibitively expensive. What do we mean by slow? We mean that the best that people can do at the moment generally is get something there the next day and somehow they feel proud about that. Prohibitively expensive, if you want it on the same day, then they're going to charge you an arm and a leg. Next slide, please. That's another meme. It's, it's humor. It's a trick. You guys laugh. It's good. <laughs> Roy, can you take us through the solution, please? The answer to your dreams. So OneDrop is a mobile and web application that allows a consumer to send something from point A to point B. We work over short distances. We are super cheap, but not like your uncle. We save you money. There's no faxes. It's an application and a web app, so you go to the website and you fill in your information, click a button, and you know what? In 15 minutes, a man will arrive at your door, or a woman, and will collect your stuff and send it to a location of your choosing. 
We're super fast. We're intra-city deliveries. So if you place your order, it'll be delivered within an hour. And it's real-time updates. So you know exactly where your package is at all times. Uh, next one, please, doctor. Thank you. So how does it work? It's very straightforward. You sign up and log in, like you've done with Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or anything else today. You specify the pickup address, the sender name and contact details. This is very important. We need to know who you are and where you are. Rinse, repeat for the recipient address and contact details, and then you pay up. We'd use credit cards, and then we charge you to the app and email you the invoice. Stand by for delivery satisfaction. So that's what it looks like on Android, on our Android app, which is native. Um, that's a fancy word for means that it's on the Google Play Store. Um, you'll see on that screen, well, let's just adjust my right. On the your left-hand side, science, um, is the splash screen. Then you go into the login. Then that is uh, geolocating to where you are in the middle. That's the pay screen there on the Android app. And that is the confirmation that it has been placed. Please, next one. This is what it looks like on um, the desktop version, the splash screen, um, then at the top and then moving next is your login screen, bottom is the geolocation, and then there's the geolocation for the uh, drop-off address and thereafter the payment and the quote. Next screen, please. So this is just a few close-ups. Um, you'll see what the, the screen looks like when you first want to put in the input address. It gives your name, it gives your um, address, you can type it in, it'll, it'll autocomplete because we use Google uh, maps, and yes, the judges are handsome, <coughs> Tom Manners. You put in the mobile number there and you press next. Next. Then uh, you put in the receiver name, and in this case it's Roy, he's at 66 Albert Road in Woodstock, Cape Town. And you put in his mobile number and you put in the instructions. For example, uh, find the fairly average looking guy with okay personality on the fourth floor wearing the one drop shirt. But in this case it's no for real, these judges are fine. Next slide, please. That is the receipt, um, that's 35 Rand, that's the quote, you accept it and you're locked in at 35 Rand. If you get into a taxi and uh, you get charged per kilometer, as we charge per kilometer, it's okay if there's an oil spill and it takes four hours. You understand because you're in the car, right? You go, okay, there was a problem, hence I pay more. In this case, no one cares whether the driver who's doing the delivery takes long because they got attacked by a seagull or some scenario. It just needs to get from point A to B. So once the, once the price is locked in, it's locked in and that's the price. Next, please. So the business model. So we take 30% of the fare and 70% of the fare goes to the service provider, which means we didn't actually have any employees, but we partner with a number of different drivers, couriers, and people who are looking for part-time work to supplement their income. Fares are calculated at seven rand per kilometer, and there's a minimum spend of 35 rand for the fare. So what that means effectively is if you want to go one kilometer, it's 35 rand. If you want to go four kilometers, it's 35 rand. And if you want to go five kilometers, it's 35 rand. We generally, uh, since launch, we've seen that average phase means 60 Rand, and we are projecting with about 4 million Rand revenue over the next 12 months. Thanks, Roy. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is how we get to market. So we've just launched. Um, we've got our MVP versions, obviously, the first iterations, um, the Android app that you saw, and the desktop version, and also the mobile site if you don't have an Android phone. Um, the getting to market, we're going to be targeting small to medium B2B, um, uh, small to medium businesses as a B2B solution, sending documents, that kind of thing, and also B2C solution um, for retailers. Um, so far, we found that an effective B2B partnership that we've just struck up is SnapScan. SnapScan, you guys know, um, when SnapScan signs somebody up, they have to give them a QR code printed. I know, it's weird. Um, and also a phone, a physical phone. Um, and they also have to take their FICA information. What we're doing for them is taking those packages and we're getting them to the SnapScan merchants and we're signing them up on a journey app, which is also a Fire ID thing, but you guys don't need to know about that. Um, and then they sign their signature on the phone and that's what SnapScan pays us for. And we've done over 300 of those since we launched 21 days ago. Um, Partnerships in phase two, mobile retail purchase and delivery. Customers select items for purchase on the app, um, uh, on a app rather, and have it delivered to them. Verticals to be targeted there, pharmaceuticals, alcohol, baby products, pet food, condoms. Phase three, check out API for super fast, same city, e-commerce, omni-channel delivery in B2C and B2B environments. What does that mean? Somebody sells something on the internet or they sell something in store but they need it delivered. The, the hub that they can have it collected from is perhaps a retail outlet instead of a warehouse, which makes the spoke very short, which makes delivery very fast. Right, Roy, you're up next. Next slide, please. Please excuse Simon, he's terrible. So what gives us our competitive advantages? Firstly, we're the first mover in the space, 
We've got, we don't actually hire drivers, we have partnerships. And we don't call them drivers, we call them heroes, because they're there to save you from your everyday, mundane career experiences. The limited register barriers to entry due to the fact that we actually aren't a courier company, but we're a lead generator and a service provider. It's very easy to use. My mom uses it, still uses it, and she loves it. Limited liability. There's no fleet management. We don't have to worry about cars. We don't have to worry about insurance or PAYE or a number of different other things. Speed and price. It's really quick and it's really cost effective. You can't beat that. Next one, Mr. DJ. Okay, so this is the team. As you can see, there's me, Roy, with the big face. There's Simon with the little over here. And then we've got the actual real company, which is our tech team. So we've got CTO. It's is Shamil Gabir. He's about this tall, but he carries a stick about this big. An incredible developer. And then we've got Wilson Kanda, who's a young man from Angola and the Ukraine. Yeah, literally the only one on planet Earth. And then we have another gentleman called Benjamin Clausens. And the five of us make Team Wamdrop. We're very strong in terms of sales. We're very in terms of strong operations and incredibly powerful in terms of development. Thank you. That's us. I believe the next slide is actually thank you if we got to the thank you. But if you have any questions, we'd love to take them. I mean, thanks, guys. That was, that was awesome. Any, yeah. questions? any questions for Gavin? I'm a very by the way. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Um, sorry, you said the delivery was um, within the hour. Yeah. And, uh, Again, in your last slide, you limited that to within city. So, so do you offer between cities? No, not. Yet. not. But we are, we are working on partnering with, I mean, this is a long-term strategic plan, partnering with an existing national or multinational courier so that we're the touch point for any kind of delivery, whether it be intercity or intercity. So I, think, I thought I was projecting pretty well. But anyway, um, so whether it's two other cities or within the same city, um, we'd be the touch point and we'd pass it on to our national career partner. That's the dream. But right now, it's intercity, intra-city. So we're effectively a last mile solution. Yeah. The best kind. That's a very good question. Um, so we vet them by doing a police check on them. We've got vetting software that we bought. It's very expensive, but it's once off. They take a fingerprint. They go to a database. We get somebody who's vetted them back. Do they have a criminal record? What is their past and so on? Um, so they undergo that process. Secondly, not only um, are we very keen to vet them from a legal perspective to cover our butts, we're also very keen to vet them from a quality perspective. So up until now, the reason why delivery generally hasn't been, excuse me, Mom, why are you calling me now? Um, the reason why delivery generally isn't as awesome as it could be is because the quality of the actual delivery, the person getting it to you, the human being, isn't exactly a VDE barista in terms of enthusiasm, right, or, or excellence. So that's what we're also trying to work towards. So we vet them in terms of their personality, um, in terms of their skill, in terms of how they can handle a phone, can they drive a car effectively, do they have knowledge of a city? So the next question is, what about scale? It sounds like you're trying to find... Oh, and insurance. Okay. Insurance, we're insured uh, for two and a half grand per package with a maximum load coverage of 25 grand. We have a right of refusal for the drivers. If you want to send a diamond ring or a child, we'll say no. Um, <laughs> and then in terms of scale, um, we're like, you know, we've got these awesome drivers, isn't that really hard? What happens if you lose one? Doesn't that take a long time to train them? Yes. So, in order to guarantee the uh, loyalty of the driver pool, how do you make them stay loyal? You make them earn one round more than anybody else. They can do that because they're on motorbikes, therefore they can do more deliveries per hour than anybody else to make more money. Secondly, we've got a rent-to-own system that's going to be implemented from the next two months. Drivers have the option to buy a vehicle if we vet them and deem them good enough to, be, to want to buy a vehicle through us. We're empowering the people. I think in the inches of time. Thanks very much. Yep. Thanks That's so good much. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Tech for Africa colleagues here. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank uh, the opportunity to present uh, our uh, application. And uh, we'll just give you a brief uh, run through of what we presented. and. Uh, in closing down, just also a bit of feedback uh, that we received. Uh, thank you. Um, hi. Um, did you introduce us? Um, 
Uh, my name is Tabo. Uh, I'm from Afrocast. Uh, this is my partner, Mazi. We have a great team behind us. They couldn't be uh, at the stage with us. But we'll take just a few minutes of your time to share with you uh, this innovative idea that um, uh, we knew it was a good idea, but we didn't think it would be on the stage. But uh, for that, we'd like to thank IBM for giving us the opportunity to share our ideas with you. Uh, we were called at one of uh, leading steel companies in South Africa to tender for a, a Microsoft product. I know we are at IBM, but I think I can share a bit about a product called SharePoint. Uh, they wanted a SharePoint uh, installation in the in infrastructure, but the challenge is that they had plus minus 7,000 users who were not on the communication networks. They are working due to in... An emergency, it is necessary to evacuate. Due to an emergency, it is necessary to evacuate. Due to an emergency, it is necessary to evacuate. Due to an emergency, it is necessary to evacuate. Due to an emergency, it is necessary to evacuate. Due to an emergency, it is necessary to evacuate. Too hard to handle. Too 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 who just say a bit about you? Um, yes, uh, basically I head um, development uh, uh, section of the company. So uh, we do mobile stuff cross-platform and um, uh, we help build uh, the mobile bulletin app we will present to you. So there's a few other developers apart from me who couldn't be here. Uh, a few Java guys back in and a few business analysts as well. And they would have loved to be here. Uh, so thank you. I think we'll take it away. Uh, okay. we presenting a tool called uh, Mobile Bulletin. It's a communication tool that uh, today we're just going to be focusing on the mining sector and the steel sector. That's, that's where we have currently found traction, but the application is it's, it's applicable in a lot of uh, environments, as you will see. Uh, what we experienced in the country in 2012, when there was a tragedy in, in Marigana, uh, that was one of the motivating factors for us to use technology to try to uh, uh, play a role in trying to make uh, the relationship between mine workers or people who work in a steel company with their head office. And we came up with a USSD-based tool where uh, someone, for example, if you have a mine worker who stays in Soweto and they wake up on Monday morning, they realize that, you know, there is a strike in Soweto and they can't use taxis to go to work. And their second problem is that they don't have airtime, they squandered all the money during the weekend. They can log into the USSD application, go into templates and send uh, a message to the head office or to their boss that uh, there's an issue and I won't be coming into work today. So we are able to make uh, free communication available to those who need it the most, especially guys who are into the feature phone uh, market. Uh, basically, uh, other areas where our application helps in a corporation is to uh, lessen the kind of complex uh, situation that the mining companies and steel companies and any other related industries where their union is involved, uh, where a, a, a company can't communicate directly with an employee, they have to go through a union. Uh, our tool makes it possible for a bi-directional communication between uh, the head office and the employee and the employee back to the head office without uh, the message being diluted in the middle by, at times, unions. <clears throat> And uh, one of the uh, 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 areas that we, we're trying to, to alleviate is the fact that 18% of the GDP is being contributed by, by the mining industry, which employs 5 million people directly and uh, another 5 million indirectly. 
And if we look at the strike that took uh, place uh, this year, uh, early this year, it, co it was costing around a tune of 400 million a day. And employees, their families, and all those who are uh, related to them made a loss of 7.3 billion. And the producers, being the mining companies and the steel companies, lost to, uh, a tune of 23 billion in, in a space of five months. So all this can be uh, avoided by using uh, uh, a simple tool that a person can, uh, employee can log in. As you can see on the screen, it kind of looks like a, an email on USSD. You have your inbox, you have your send items. Uh, they can even access voice notes. Uh, these are <coughs> uh, sound bites of meetings that might be happening at the whole office. Uh, they log in there, they get a call back by IVR, and they can listen to what has been uh, spoken about in their language. Uh, the application supports uh, all 11 official languages. And other features that we have is uh, uh, instant voting, where you can ask employees how was this week, how was your month, or do you guys think we should do that and not do that? So employees feel uh, connected and part of uh, the, the, the company. Yeah, as you can take from here. Um, so yeah, in the brief and in gist, uh, the application is a communication tool for very large organizations with uh, very large workforces. So um, also just in terms of where we plan to go with this application, at the moment, uh, we use it as a data capturing tool, and uh, there's a lot of metrics that we are gathering. And the future hopes is that uh, one day we'll be able to walk into an organization and say, guys, thank you for using the platform. And because you're using it, um, based on the surveys that we've been conducting over the past two days with your employees, uh, this is what uh, employee satis uh, satisfaction looks like, because we do conduct surveys as well. And of course, it's an immediate communication tool between the employee and uh, depending on the hierarchy, uh, any stakeholders above. And also, it's also, uh, we said it uh, works downstream as well. We want to empower uh, the employees. So things like reports uh, that promote transparency, those, we want to get them in the hands of the employees as well. The guy that's working, uh, working every day into the tunnel, digging and uh, nobody really uh, pays attention to him. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's what our app does in just, and hopefully one day, maybe in a few months or a year or so after all the input you've gotten, uh, we'll be able to grow this into something which uh, employees can use to add, uh, I mean, a uh, company, sorry, can use to add value to their um, organizations and of course uh, promote uh, communication between the different stakeholders, particularly the organization and its um, employees. So um, thank you for the opportunity and uh, great, awesome. Thanks. Great, thanks, gentlemen. Great pitch. All right, folks, what's going to happen next is our judges are going to be taking that, uh, those two pictures and they're going to go and deliberate. Due to an emergency, it is necessary to evacuate. Due to an emergency, it is necessary to evacuate. I'm getting a signal to stay. Due to an emergency, it is necessary to evacuate. Due to an emergency, it is necessary to evacuate. Don't move, apparently. I had a signal at the back. Stay. All right. Um, so. What's going to happen next? Um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Um, Solomon Asifa, is going to give us a very exciting talk about cognitive computing. And um, after that, we'll announce the, the winners from the, the regional finals. Okay, so, Dr. Solomon. Okay. Um, I hope all of you had a very, very exciting day. Uh, full of uh, talks and uh, different events. Uh, my name is Solomon, and today I'll be telling you about cognitive computing. Uh, but before, actually I'll be telling you about cognitive computing, as well as what IBM is doing in the continent. Uh, before I tell you that, actually, I would like to tell you a bit about IBM research, which has been part, actually a big part of the innovation story for the last 100 years in terms of all of the IT innovations that has been changing and transforming our world. So we have 12 labs across the globe, about 3,000 uh, scientists. As you can see, we are distributed all across the globe, um, in the US, China, India, and the, the 12th lab 
we started last year, it was inaugurated in Kenya. Uh, so that was a very, very exciting time for IBM to actually bring research and innovation to the continent. And what you can see here is actually IBM research is about making the world our lab. It's not about being confined in one building, it's actually about going to different places where there are a lot of challenges and making sure that we can contribute to, towards changing or solving those challenges and uh, creating new innovation by collaborating with people that are dealing with those, those challenges. Um, so as I mentioned, IBM has been part of the innovation story for the last 100 years. Sometimes when I think about some of the innovations, actually, they give me chills. It's, it's, it's quite uh, exciting. So, you know, starting from the first large-scale uh, computing machine, all the way to the first magnetic recording for storage, uh, all the way to Fortran programming language, uh, as well as even the Apollo program. If you think about it, you know, th that's a program that uh, took two astronauts to the moon. The IC, the integrated circuit on the uh, on the, you know, on the spacecraft itself was actually built by IBM, as well as all of the mission control. So it's quite exciting when you think about all of that innovation. And of course, uh, you can think about supercomputing. You know, we're leaders in supercomputing, um, even quantum computing. IBM is the leader when it comes to co quantum computing as well as quantum communications. And even when you look into your computer, if you look at the, you know, for example, your, the DRAM, the memory, it was you know, invented by IBM, as well as the back-end metallization itself, right? So we have a lot of innovations, not only from the programming and, you know, the IT side, but also even in nanotechnology. Some of the cutting-edge nanotechnology is coming from some of our labs in, you know, Zurich and, you know, uh, the U.S. in Watson. And three years ago, uh, we actually gave the world one of the most exciting, in my opinion, one of the most exciting innovations, which is Watson. So that's the Watson Cognitive uh, Computing System, which is basically a system that's inspired by the brain, right? So if you look at humans, what we do is we know how to interact, we know how to learn, and also we know how to store information for quite a long time, right? So I'll come back to cognitive computing, but it's really a brain-inspired kind of system. Now, before going into that, let me tell you about the eras of computing, right? The first era is really the tabulating uh, system era. And that's where, you know, people, and that's in the 19th century all the way up to uh, 1940. And that's the time when people were using mechanical devices to actually uh, sort through data as well as do computation. And it had quite a lot of impact when it comes to sensors, inventory for, for railroads and, uh, you know, social programs and so forth. Especially in the U.S. it had quite a lot of impact, right? Then we had the programmable systems era. Now, that's, you know, started around the uh, 1940s, and it's about the mainframes, uh, which had a huge impact when it comes to back office transaction, which impacted banks, airlines, and the insurance industry, as well as after that, you know, the personal computing systems, uh, which really, you know, increased efficiency of humans, right? Our productivity was increased because of uh, personal computers, and of course, the internet, which allowed us to connect to each other, connect, you know, wherever you are, you can connect to each other and do a lot of work. So that's a programmable era. But I argue that now we are in a new era, which is the cognitive systems era, right? So cognitive is, you know, pertains to mental processes, perception, memory, judgment, learning, and reasoning. So let me explain to you what's the difference between the programmable era and the cognitive era, right? So in the programmable systems era, humans actually have to program computers so that they can perform a specific task, right? In cognitive systems era, it's not about programming this system. It's actually about interaction and learning from the interaction. The second point is during the program, uh, systems, programmable systems era, it's all about basically shrinking down the transistors and increasing the performance of uh, you know, the transistors as well as the computer. So it's about fast calculations. In the new era, it's not just about fast calculations. It's about learning from big data. It's about ingesting a lot of data, learning, and having insight. It's not, it's not just really about speed and how fast you're, you know, following Moore's law to 
to shrink down and make you know, the fastest transistors or the fastest computer. It's more than that. It's about insight. Right? And it's also very interesting because in the programmable era, you know, your computers and programs over time, actually, they're depreciating in price and they're becoming less and less use useful. On the other hand, in the cognitive systems era, your systems are actually becoming more and more useful because over time, they're ingesting data and they're learning more and more. So they're getting much more smarter, which means that they can actually help you become more productive, more insightful, right? And finally, again, I mean, the programmable era is really about, you know, the CMOS devices or the chips that you have in your computer. But here, it's about what you do with the data. It's not, you know, the systems that you build is not just based on the architecture defined by the hardware. The system is actually going to be inspired by the brain, which means that you will have new types of architectures which will be able to deal with big data as we know it, right? So I've been telling you about big data. Let me come to what it means, you know, where are we when we talk about big data? So it's predicted that in 2020, the amount of data in the whole world will actually be uh, about 40 zettabytes, right? Uh, I think all of you probably know your Greek alphabets, like mega, giga, tera, peta, and exa, zeta, and so forth, right? Zeta means 10 to the 21st. That's a huge number, right? I mean, if, for example, if I, I believe if a byte was just, you know, one paper or one dollar bill, that amount, of, that amount of data would actually be reaching to the moon and coming back about 50 or 140 times, 150 times roughly. So it's a huge amount of data that we're sitting on. And that data is being generated by the enterprise, by voice over IP, by social media. You are the guys that are generating a lot of this data through social media and so forth. And of course, Internet of Things, right? Everything is being instrumented. Your cars are being instrumented. Your house is being instrumented. And that's generating a huge amount of data. So right now we are here. You know, we're just barely at the tip here. And just imagine what's going to be happening. But th the problem actually gets worse over time, especially when we bring cognitive computing into the, into the picture, right? So the data is not just big in volume. It has a lot of noise in it. There is a lot of veracity, which means that the systems have to take in all of this information, and they have to extract features from it, right? So by the time you do that, then you know, the amount of data is actually increasing. And then by the time you're trying to link different domains and trying to get insight, yet again, you know, the amount of data is, continues to increase. And then finally, to really help humans, you have to have you know, cont contextual analytics. And by then, as you can see, the information or the amount of data is actually, again, increasing exponentially, right? So this is a big problem. And actually, within IBM, we're doing a lot of work to figure out how we can handle such type of uh, data. Because, the, again, the age of Moore's law, where you're shrinking down transistors, has come to an end, mainly because of the limitation of physics. Right now, people are working on you know, transistors that have only five angstroms or a few atoms. You cannot go beyond that. It's just by nature, we're going to be limited. So we have to do things like, for example, Hadoop systems, right? How can you configure things in such a way that they will be very, very um, you know, efficient for machine learning? So we're working on things like that. New type of file systems. You know, we're working on those type of uh, systems as well. So this is a problem that the world is facing and has to deal with in a very, very creative way. So now let me come back to cognitive computing. If you remember, I said cognitive computing is brain-inspired systems, not the usual architecture that we've been dealing with up to now. So these systems are able to reason, they're able to learn, and they also remember for a long time. So they're very, very useful to humans in many, many ways, starting from assistance. For example, for a call center person or for uh, a customer agent, you know, the cognitive system could look through hundreds of millions of pages within seconds, right? And then provide precise information to, to the agent so that the agent knows how to deal with the client or person who's calling in. This is not something that a human can do by himself or her, herself. So that's the assistance part of it. The second is about understanding. Again, ingesting a lot of data 
and then actually having insight. For example, how to increase efficiency, how to do optimizations, say, in an industrial setting. Right? These machines are able to do those type of tasks. And then decision systems. These cognitive systems will be able to give us unbiased information. And that's why we need to make concrete decisions, strategic decisions that will, that will enable us to, for example, make a very good investment, right? And then finally, discovery, right? So if you look at the pharmaceutical uh, industry, for example, to discover a drug, it takes trillions of combinations, right? So again, a doctor or a pharmacist by himself or herself cannot do that. Now imagine combining what Watson or our cognitive computing technology with, you know, a doctor or a, a physician or a, pharm a pharmacy, and that could lead to a new type of drug delivery. So these are the advantages that we get from uh, cognitive computing and the new era. So, and I, I think you have all heard about Watson. Right? In 2011, Watson made history. So. That was the first time that cognitive computing actually took to the stage and we, developed, we showed what we had developed. So just to give you a background, it was a project that was just started by a few researchers at IBM TJ Watson. It was 10, 15 researchers working on a grand challenge program and we, have, we often have these grand challenges every five, 10 years. Previous to the Watson uh, technology, the other grand challenge was the Deep Blue Machine. I don't know if you know about it, but that's the machine that played chess and won uh, when playing with Kasparov, right? So this is yet another result from a grand challenge within IBM Research. And um, so we had the deb debut in 2011. I'll show you a video. What's very interesting here is that, you know, again, Watson, you know, can understand uh, sentences that have double meanings, right? Not just straightforward, very easy interaction, but something that has very deep meaning, hints, uh, double meanings. It can cut through that and understand. And beyond understanding, it can actually, again, process millions of documents to come to an answer. And it, the way it does come to an answer is by making some very, very interesting logical connections to different facts. So let's see if the video works. An IBM computer system named Watson won Jeopardy. But the real winner? Humankind. Life is really about questions and answers. This technology can help us get some of those answers. We're going to revolutionize many, many fields with this new capability. Healthcare, government, finance, anywhere decision making depends on deeper understanding of the huge wealth of information that's out there. I thought the game was the end. I'm realizing it's just the beginning. That's what I'm working on. I'm an IBMer. So why is it difficult for humans to interact with computers or computers to interact with humans? One is, you know, the strange conversations we have or the strange things that we say. For example, you say, you know, we might say your nose is running or your feet is smelly, you're on fire. You know, these are things that have double meaning, very difficult to understand for a machine. Right? So we had to develop a technology that enables a machine to think like a human and understand this type of sentences and this type of phrases. Uh, we also ask very, very tough questions, right? I mean, this is a tough question. I can't even, you know, really ask it. What mix of zero coupon, non-callable, A plus, munis fit my risk portfolio? That's a very, very tough question for a human to answer, right? And also for a computer to answer. So it required a lot of research and a lot of development in order to make it happen. So Watson cognitive technology understands natural language, as I mentioned. You know, the colloquial way that we speak, it knows how to cut through that and how to understand it. And then it actually generates, it generates hypothesis based on evidence, right? And then what it does, it just doesn't give you an answer straight away. It first generates a hypothesis based on the evidence and then it evaluates the evidence. Right? So it compares, evaluates the ev evidence, and then it does some sort of you know, confidence level measurement. And then finally, it provides you the best answer that, that, that's you know, the best answer that fits a question. So more than that, 
it actually learns over time, like I mentioned, which makes cognitive computing very, very valuable over time, is that it continues to learn, it continues to be smarter and smarter. So it's very, very different from search. So Watson and cognitive computing is about discovery, not about search. In search, what you're really doing is you have a question, you find the keyword, and then you do some ranking algorithm, and then you're straight to the answer. Here, you ask a question, you put the question in, in context, right? So you really cut through what's the meaning of the question that's asked, what's the meaning of the phrases and so forth, and then you have potential responses with evidence, and then you go through and evaluate the evidences, and it's only then that you find you, you provide the answers. So Jeopardy was you know, the big stage where we showed that we had that technology. It was in 2011. After that, we actually have done quite a lot with Watson. Uh, the most important work that we have done is, for example, in cancer research with Sloan Kettering, uh, where we're using the system to develop individualized treatments. Uh, with uh, Anderson, MD Anderson, we're doing novel treatment discoveries. And we're also working with WellPoint, for example, to you know, help with quality of care. And we're working with Cleveland Clinic to prepare doctors for the future. So this technology is not just you know, for a question and answer, for a Jeopardy-like kind of you know, show. It's actually being used in real life situations, right? So. I thought Jeopardy was just a, a great uh, example of what this system could do. Watson can probe every nook and cranny of their record and, and try to learn more about them than any one doctor can. It truly is personalizing the care of that patient in a way we're never before possible. We're developing a set of solutions that will bring Watson's cognitive uh, computing capabilities to decision support around medical technology. The cognitive computing capabilities are truly unique and unparalleled. Done correctly and applied correctly, they can democratize the use of, of clinical evidence in a way that has never been done before. The Watson technology is a leapfrog in computing technology. And to me, it affords the um, capability to learn the art of medicine, not just the science of medicine. So, so like in, you can see, it's, it's real. It's, you know, we're working with doctors, nurses, and a lot of other people to really continuously improve the system so that we can have real impact, especially in drug discovery, cancer treatment, and other things. And Watson is also not just a single machine anymore. Watson is available on the cloud. Actually, today we had an announcement about the Watson Group. Earlier this year, IBM made a $1 billion investment in order to start a completely new uh, business group. It's called Watson Group. Uh, the inauguration of the new offices happening as we speak uh, with a lot of dignitaries and so forth. So Watson is really available on the cl cloud uh, you can actually go ahead and register and so forth. We can give you more information. We're working uh, with 200 uh, partners and entrepreneurs that have already registered. We have 10 startups that are actually developing applications uh, that are powered by Watson. So it's, it's really you know, moving forward. And we, we continue to get more and more requests on how uh, people can sign up and you know, use Watson. Uh, our Watson engagement advisor is also something that has taken, that has gotten a lot of traction. So what this uh, engagement advisor does is, as I mentioned before, you have, uh, you know, uh, for example, a call center or an agent who is dealing with a lot of calls and a lot of customers and so forth. So what it does is it can go and uh, sift through 100 millions of uh, pages and within a second or two, it can provide a precise answer, right? So that's something the agent cannot do, and that's something that saves time. But what's even more interesting is it can go beyond that and anticipate further questions, you know, questions to questions. Now, you can imagine how that can drastically and fundamentally transform how we do customer engagement and how an individual can actually interact with a company, you know, with, with such, a type, such a system. So it will really, really transform how, you know, individuals engage with you know, big companies. 
Uh, we also have a big announcement coming out of South Africa today, actually. It's about a partnership between IBM and uh, Metropolitan Health. Uh, where we just announced the first commercial application of Watson in Africa. And the whole idea, again, is to use Watson Engagement Advisor in order to transform customer health uh, advisory services and to really provide outcome-based uh, kind of uh, wellness services. So you can read more about it. I'm sure it's all over the news. The next question is, so, you know, what's next, right? So we have brought Watson to this level. What are, what's next? Where do we want to take it? What we would like to do is actually give Watson the power to see. So we're working on a technology where Watson can process you know, a lot of images. If you look at uh, a physician, for example, a physician can probably you know, process hundreds or maybe thousands of you know, MRI scans and so forth. However, MRIs can actually produce hundreds of thousands of medical images, right? So that's where the power to see will be very, very useful. Right? It's not just about you know, sifting through uh, hundreds of thousands of MRI scans or x-rays, but it's actually about finding things that humans cannot find from those type of images. Okay, so we're also giving Watson the power to reason. You can go on YouTube and see a video about this. We're working on a technology called a debater, right? Okay, we're working on a technology called a debater, and this is way beyond Watson. Watson provides you you know, the answers, right? Evidence-based answers. But not everything has evidence. There are things that are in the middle, you know? Not everything is black and white. There are things that are gray. So this type of system can actually provide pros and cons, and then it can uh, form sentences and tell you the pros and cons and the, ar the argument. And then, if you go and challenge the system, it can come with a rebuttal. So we're working on the system. We're, we're hoping that we'll debut the system uh, not too far from now. And uh, let me, so I won't go through all of this. I just want to conclude by saying the following, OK? So you all know Africa is at a t tipping point. There's a lot that's happening in terms of economic development, stability, and all of the investments that are coming in and so forth. At the same time, as I mentioned, we're in a new era, a cognitive era, right? I think those intersections are going to be providing the whole continent with a lot of opportunities. And I think something that you have to think about in terms of how we can leapfrog moving forward. The same way as the mobile phone has allowed us to do a leapfrog and forget about legacy systems, cognitive systems such as Watson will be able to do the same. All right. Thank you very much.